Time for some more Kitchen Table Astronomy with Hampshire College astronomer Dr. Salman Hamid, Mr. Universe. Not only from Hampshire College, but from Kainat, where you are using the means of the internet to show the world what the universe is like with these incredible videos. And you will be traveling the world shortly to do the same thing, some citizen science talks and communicating science in China. And China is part of the topic of our conversation today. Uh, yes, so there is a conference about, uh, or a workshop, about public science communication. And I'm giving a talk on um, sort of like, you know, the challenges and promise of communicating science in different cultures. So I, I do, of course, on Fabulous 413. So Fabulous 413 will feature in the talk. Cool. But also uh, in Pakistan, or audience in South Asia. So what kind of things in a global context... Uh, everything, so what we talk about is also uh, potentially listenable, if that's a word, uh, <laughs> around the world. And so what kind of promises it brings, but what kind of challenges uh, it also brings. Because, And one of the things uh, that my uh, focus is, is about knowing your audience. Because you should always, in science communication, target audience. Who's your audience? That's how you talk about it. That's what your interest is. But in a globalized world, that actually presents you with a challenge of who you are talking to and how it gets interpreted. Mm -hmm. So that's my talk over there. Uh, and, um, and of course, there is some uh, excitement because I still don't have my visa yet. Yeah. I was going to ask Congressman McGovern to help out, but the Chinese don't love him. Uh, yeah, so I'm not asking him, but I'm just hoping, I mean, you know, uh, to get visa in time. And I'm hoping that I'm not talking to you in two weeks when I'm in China. But otherwise, you know, Monty, I'll spend more time with you. Okay, that should be great, too. But China, I mean, it's we've talked about this for years now. There is a a sort of space race brewing between the United States and China. The United States has all sorts of projects with lots of countries around the world, China oftentimes excluded. So then China goes and starts its own thing and excludes the United States. China, though, has been doing some incredible stuff on the moon. Right. So, uh, But to be fair, I, I mean, I should mention that uh, China did make, I mean, so they're, they are the ones who have gotten samples from the moon lately mm -hmm. and those are the first samples both from the near side and from the far side and from the far side nobody has ever gotten samples uh, but this is the first time except that from, from the pink floyd album i mean that that is such a sampleable album like you could work that into so many different like hip-hop songs or whatever uh, but it all has to do with money yeah right. as you know <laughs> so, that's a good one to do. That, yeah. right. uh, and also with uh, us and them i have to mention when yeah. we're talking about moon and like you know china and the u.s so <laughs> Oh, anyways, uh, and, and lunatic. So here is the thing. China actually sent a mission, Chang'e 5, which brought rocks from, um, from the near side of the moon. But this is where it comes in that in science, even though you go like, well, here is a rivalry, so and so forth. But within the sciences, you are always learning from the other and you are building on the knowledge and information you have from others as well. So Apollo and the Russian Luna mission, uh, they're the ones who had gotten rocks back and Apollo astronauts, of course, uh, brought a lot of uh, rocks back. But it suggested, which is a reasonable assumption, that moon has not been active for a few billion years. And by active, you mean in a, like a plate tectonics volcano underground set. Right, so when you have planets are the way the moons form, there is heat at the center, but if you are smaller bodies, you basically go inert. You are you run out of heat, and so you nothing much is happening. Unless you have plate tectonics, which most places don't. Earth does. Uh, or if you have larger bodies, you have enough radioactive material that it can keep the center hot. And for the moon, we know that it had volcanism because... Spock lived there. <laughs> That's right. But you can actually look up at the moon and you see these darker spots. And those are uh, what we call them mare or seas. But those are actually not water. But in fact, when Galileo actually looked at them through the telescope as well in 1610, he saw them and he goes like, well, they look like seas. They look like Maria. That's what he said. Uh -huh. Like, you know, uh, but 
now we know actually those are volcanic areas. There was volcanic flow, but... So the face of the man in the moon, or person in the moon, that's all done because of volcanism. That's exactly right. So, But that volcanism was around, and because of the Apollo missions, they went in, brought samples back, lunar mission, Russian lunar mission, and that volcanism they could actually date to about three billion years ago. Mm -hmm. So there is a period of time, and again, there are all these other challenges of why that was the case, but there was an active bombardment on the moon and volcanism on the moon actually around three to 3.8 billion years ago. And everybody was like, okay, that makes sense. There was volcanism earlier on, but now it doesn't happen because uh, we don't expect it to be volcanically active. But there was some tantalizing hints, and I'm going to come back to it in a second, that uh, there was a lunar reconnaissance orbiter. Um, this was um, um, a NASA mission, American mission, actually. And it looked at some features on the moon that looked like, well, they're a little odd. And, uh, and, and they said, well, we, we would call them, as astronomers are great with names, irregular mare patches, because they were irregular they were mare and they were like the patches and so uh, <laughs> and they have a cool acronym imp 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 <laughs> right <laughs> and and so they look like and you can actually look at them and you can guess or you or, or not guess but you can actually assess uh, you can say something about their age based on the number of craters that you see on them so because moon doesn't have an atmosphere, so everything that goes in, it actually hits on the, to the, on the moon and it forms a crater. So even if you have a smaller thing or a bigger thing or what's so, uh, like, you know, and all of these things. So this is how astronomers, by counting the number of craters, can determine if the surface that you are looking at is younger or not. So if you have fewer craters, that means it's relatively younger. If you have more craters, it means it's relatively old, simply because... If you had more craters, then it would have been wiped out. Uh, yeah, like look at my bald head. The older I get, every little dent or <laughs> nick that I get in there, it's there forever. When I was younger, my bald head looked fine. Now it's got this weird growth. It's got this scar from when I was playing on a playground two years ago. And there are some irregular hair patches yeah, over there. So, right. so I you think, can tell, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And I have no atmosphere up there, a la hair. <laughs> so everything just hits it. and it's. So... That's how astronomers looked at it, and it looked like that there were areas, these patches, these imps, are uh, maybe a few hundred million years old, or maybe even younger, maybe 50 million years. But this was an indirect assessment. This was just looking at it from uh, the craters. And so Chang'e 5 mission. The Chinese mission. The Chinese mission that went in 2020 and brought samples back. So it deliberately, the place that it picked was a relatively younger place and that was about the surface was expected to be around a billion year old or something like that so they knew what apollo missions had found what lunar missions had found and so they were like okay so let's complement that so this is how science works you go like okay we don't want to just go back to the same place because we know what we found from there but let's go to a place which can actually find something new and complement what we already know and answer some of the newer questions that were raised. So they went to this uh, other place. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's called um, Mons, uh, let me, uh, uh, Rumker, and so mountain of Rumker. And so that is a place that has these this volcanic slope. So there were these, uh, some place where there was some volcanism, maybe a little bit sooner than a billion years or so. It went over there brought some samples, uh, a few pounds of it. I think it's about four pounds, um, a little less than two kilogram. And recently, a paper got published um, uh, recently in the journal Science uh, from, from, uh, from a lab that assessed that uh, in this lab is part of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. And what they did was they looked at a tiny fraction of it, about a few ounces, like 1.7 grams, analyzed the material in there and they found 3000 glass beads now these these and these beads are like you know a few like 20 to 40 microns in size so they're really tiny beads and they are formed oftentimes when meteoroids hit and like you know the material gets sort of like you know heats up a little and then it forms a tiny bead but also they get formed when you have some volca volcanism in there. So they can also get formed in there. But the two types of beads, 
volcanism versus the ones from meteoroid impacts have a little bit different ratio of elements that are in there. And so they looked at 3,000 of those beads and they found that three, remember out of those 3,000 glass beads, three seem to be from volcanism. And so it's like, it, first of all, just imagine, I mean, just think about it. You have sort of like, you know, this tiny sample uh, of, of the moon, uh, moon rock that you are analyzing. In it, you find something interesting. There are these 3,000 very tiny beads, and out of that, you analyze the sort of like the elements that are in there. And in particular, there's a, there's a ratio of sulfur in a particular way that comes out, and you go like, okay, well, this ratio, it determines that this was formed by a volcano, volcanic eruption, versus it was formed in a meteoroid impact. And uh, so those three of them they found, it actually gives a very specific date because if you have a sample, you can actually do radioactive dating and you use uranium for that, uh, lead to uranium ratio, for example. And they found that this, these particular beads are about 120 million years only. Which is wicked old, unless you're talking about the age of the universe when we thought it was going to be a billion years ago at least that there was volcanism on the moon this is saying much much more recently in astronomical time there was volcanoes on the moon and the cool thing is as you can imagine people first the first thing they thought about was like wait a minute the dinos were around at that time and they would have looked at the moon and they were like hey what's that red stuff oh wow wouldn't that be cool that would be cool and so to it just shows that in this particular case, in these samples, so it's a pretty solid result. This is a result because of radioactive dating. So previously, the lunar reconnaissance orbiter had just looked at it from, um, from orbit, looking using crater counting, but this actually really nails down the particular age of it. And it's clear that there was volcanism on the moon only 100 million years ago. And maybe there may be some places that are even sooner. And so why that is the case? I'm sure, Monty, you're going to ask that question. Why is that the case? If it's supposed to be this big cold object that got booted off of the Earth in the Earth's early formation time, how could volcanoes be happening there so re frequent, uh, so recently? Great question, Monty. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, but that's but that really brings up this question, right? I mean, like, you know, so the, here is this thing, the usual theory of how plan the solar system formed, how planets form, how their moons form, and moon is not that big. It should not have this kind of active volcanism a few, uh, like 100 million years ago, but it did. And so you really have to reassess that. So perhaps there are, of course, there are ideas around it. Man, maybe there is some uh, rare earth material. There is some radioactive materials that actually have some low scale volcanism that actually allowed it. Uh, but this is something that we did not expect. And if that is the case, there are a couple of uh, sort of like, you know, um, things that go from there. One, well, who's to say that it may not happen today? Or like, you know, in so the we present we could look time. up and see lava flows on the moon. Right, and it may not be that big, but, and, and there are some things called, uh, w which people have talked about, there is some uh, lunar transient phenomena. I guess it's LTP. Uh, pe some people have claimed, like, you know, they see something, uh, you know, some amateur astronomers have also seen, but they have usually been dismissed as potentially uh, something that uh, atmospheric effects or observational effects and things like that. But there are claims for, like, you know, that people have seen something over there. And it, so it may be. Uh, again, I'm not going to put much weight in it because we don't have much more evidence for that. But that will be interesting. But also, th that just means that there may be a heat source that is there which potentially astronauts who are planning both from uh, the US-led Artemis mission and Chinese-led uh, base, lunar base program as well, then that means that there may be a heat source even today right under the surface. So there are implications for that, but it's really, this is uh, to one of those things that you, know, you go like, yeah, science can actually change textbooks. This is one of the cases that if you were reading a textbook, astronomy textbook about the moon, it would say, yeah, moon is, that doesn't, moon's volcanism actually stopped a few billion years ago. 
and it would make sense based on the theories of moon and the solar system formation comes in. But now it goes like, well, actually, no, it didn't. There may have been volcanism as recent as 100 million years or even less than that. So that's really cool. And it came from, you think, hey, we know our moon. It's our, I mean, like we have studied a lot. We have sent humans. Well, no, we sent humans to specific a few places. And now when we send people uh, like, you know, space probes and other things to a different place, we learn something different. And that goes back to this question that we have addressed a lot. The moon is a phenomenally interesting object for science. And it tells us about our own formations because formation of the solar system and how planets form and the moon form. And so when we think about, and this is going to be my usual uh, preaching regarding that, like, you know, when we <laughs> think about moon mining or think about sort of like, you know, exploiting its resources, well, there is a lot of science that can be done from there. Uh, not just astronomy, because you can actually put telescopes, especially on the far side of the moon, but also lunar geology. So there is a lot of science. I really hope we protect the moon for science. I also love that even though they didn't officially work together, the scientists from the United States and the scientists from China figuring out where to look and all, using each other's information to create a global picture of what our shared moon is all about. And this was the case in the other Cold War, and I'm going to use the word other Cold War, because at that time as well, scientists were looking across because you don't want to use old data. I mean, if somebody has newer data, you are going to use that to figure out where you want to land. You're going to figure out what kind of questions you want to know about because the other questions have been answered. And so you don't want to, I mean, that's really boring if you answer the questions that have already been answered. But I should mention that even though in the US, NASA and anybody who works with NASA um, is almost barred from working with anybody from China on, on these things, but for the lunar samples that were brought in by Chang'e 5 and now Chang'e 6 from the far side of the moon, uh, the US did, or the NASA did make an exception. They're like, well, I mean, you know, if you have to borrow, I mean, you know, <laughs> we just don't have that. So there was an exception uh, or there is an exception that if you want to work uh, within that, that should work. And I think this particular uh, paper, I'm not 100% sure, but I think there was some collaboration with um, with Caltech. So, I mean, I think uh, I think that's that cooperation happens and cooperation is good. I mean, especially in this day and age when the world is inflamed, uh, science and the global aspect of that and the time frames we talk about that, I mean, I think Again, science can be used in terrible ways. It does, it, destructive forces. But look at this. I mean, you know, science can be such a fantastic unifier. And again, it brings up, wakes us up from us, our slumber to think about the larger questions that we are asking. And it doesn't matter which boundary line you, or which side of the boundary you are on, because the moon doesn't care. I mean, it's volcanism doesn't care. But it's amazing that people can look at and figure out from those three beads out of those 3,000, ah, there was volcanism here a thousand years, uh, a hundred million years ago. You hear that? You hear that, China? <laughs> the Wookiee has decided to express its own comments as well. So China, if you're listening, Salman's big, <laughs> big fan. You should let, you know, help, help the visa process. He wants to go. He wants to go speak at your conference. Well, thank you. <laughs>